Hello and welcome to the Galaxy Community Conference 2021. This is a workshop on metatranscriptomics analysis, which uses microbiome RNA-seq data and analyzes it within the Galaxy framework. This workshop is conducted by researchers from the University of Minnesota, from the Erasmus University in Netherlands, and from Norwegian University of Life Sciences in Norway. Microbiomes play an important role in the ecological balance, whether it is in environmental research or whether in health and disease conditions when studying clinical research. Multiple studies have shown the correlation of microbial composition with the physiological conditions. Gut microbiome research, for example, has been an important focus of research, especially since the gut microbiome has an effect on the health and the disease condition of the individual. In fact, the gut microbiome outnumbers in terms of genomic content or number of cells when compared to the human host cells. In fact, the gut microbiome can constitute as much as five pounds of your body weight. Apart from its effect on disease, it has been shown that a gut microbiome is unique to the individual and hence personalized medicine care would be required in order to treat conditions that have been implicated due to gut microbiome dysbiosis. In order to study gut microbiome, researchers have used methods such as metagenomics, wherein DNA from either the gut microbiome or from environmental samples is extracted and is subjected to either 16S rRNA studies or whole genome sequencing studies. The 16S rRNA studies, also called as amplicon sequencing, helps one to identify the taxonomic composition of the microbiome while the whole genome sequencing might help you to identify the genes that are present or the, uh, based on the DNA content of the genome sequenced. This helps to predict some of the functions that can be expressed by this microbiome. Multiple studies using metagenomics have helped to correlate the taxonomy with the observed phenotype. However, over the years, it has been shown that apart from studying the taxonomy of the microbiome, it is important to understand the functional expression of the microbiome with respect to the condition that it has been exposed to. For example, in 2012, a study that involved collecting samples from multiple body parts of multiple individuals showed that if one were to study the different genera that are present in these samples, so if you were to look at, for example, the buccal mucosa, you can see that the taxonomic composition is variable if you were to look at samples from individuals across the world. Similarly, if one were to use the metagenomic data that came out of this and were to predict the metabolic pathways that are associated with these microorganisms, one would find that the metabolic pathways are relatively consistent across various individuals. This indicated that using functional pathways or functional expression could be a better way of understanding the effect of perturbations on microbiome since you already have a basal level set up using functional studies. So in order to study the microbiome, as I mentioned earlier, metagenomics, which involves studying the DNA content and the taxonomy of the microbiome uh, is, is, uh, is fairly popular. In fact, there are quite a few software tools that help you to correlate the taxonomy with the physiological condition. One can also predict function based on some of the whole genome sequencing methods that are used. However, to get a better understanding of function, 
Researchers have started using metatranscriptomics, which in involves looking at the RNA expression of the microbiome. This has an advantage of not only deciphering the taxonomy of the microbiome, but also understanding the various functions that are expressed in terms of RNA expression. In the past few years, researchers have also started studying metaproteomics, which involves identifying proteins or peptides that are expressed by these organisms. And here one has a slightly better understanding of function just because of the fact that proteins represent enzymes and various effector functions that, that a microbiome expresses. We believe that both metatranscriptomics and metaproteomics have the potential to unravel the mechanistic details of microbial interactions with the host or the environment. With this, we'll move on to the hands-on section of metatranscriptomics analysis. As you can see here, metatranscriptomics has, is a multi-step multi workflow which involves multiple software tools and conversion steps, starting with pre-processing, which will be covered by Saskia Hiltemann, and then taxonomic composition, which is which will also be uh, taken care by Saskia Hiltemann, and then Subina Mehta will talk about functional analysis of the microbiome. Now that you have some background on metatranscriptomics, let's talk a little bit about the bioinformatics that makes metatranscriptomics possible. So like other large data omic uh, technologies that generate large volumes of data uh, and complex data, they require a number of tools to analyze the data and provide results that have biological importance to researchers using uh, the technology. So metatranscriptomics is no different in that way in that, uh, as you can see here, something you'll hear more about uh, as this workshop goes on, there's a number of different software tools that take in data, process it, and then annotate and analyze that data in order to give um, biological results that a researcher can use to generate new hypotheses and, and take away uh, biological knowledge from their experiment. So how do you approach this uh, general challenge of needing to do complex bioinformatic data analysis, um, but do it in a way that is accessible to, um, say, non-expert uh, bench scientists and researchers who want to um, deploy metatranscriptomics in their work? So one solution and one that our group has worked in is Galaxy. Um, without going into a lot of the, the the basic details of Galaxy, I'm going to just give a little bit of the history of why we turn to Galaxy for, for the work that we do, uh, including metatranscriptomics, and why it's um, a very useful platform for this type of, of bioinformatic application. So Galaxy, which has now been around for over 15 years, um, has a number of features that are, are really advantageous. Um, one of those being geared towards bench scientists so that you do not have to have, have advanced training uh, in terms of programming skills to use it. Um, and also the many training resources that are available. Um, very much from the, from the start has always been the home for genomic and transcriptomic uh, data analysis tools. That was really sort of the, the genesis of Galaxy as a platform, a workbench to bring together lots of tools in these areas that, that could be integrated together and made more usable by the community. Um, and also, as, as we discovered, one of the, the main focus points of our work is actually in proteomics, mass spectrometry-based proteomics. So our group, uh, in, in addition to being interested in things like metatranscriptomics, has been developing Galaxy uh, extensions to bring in software for proteomics through the Galaxy for Proteomics project, this Galaxy P project, which is the logo you're going to see on a number of our slides. And as you're going to see, what we have, uh, have done in terms of approaching Galaxy development is this idea that we do not want to reinvent the wheel. We take many high-value tools that have been generated as, as sort of high-value standalone software 
and use the, the features of Galaxy to implement those in Galaxy so that they will run through the Galaxy platform and then integrate those with other tools, including um, customized tools and things that, that, um, that make these workflows and, and things uh, much more available and usable by the community. So another look at Galaxy is, is this. It, it takes in data sets. This can be metatranscriptomic data or other types of omics data. It's a home for then software tools. So it could be diverse different types of software tools that can be integrated and made interoperable together, as well as visualization tools and some of the things that you will see here in this workshop. These can be implemented, the Galaxy platform itself, run on, on diverse different types of scalable computing resources, such as the cloud or local high performance computing infrastructure. All of that is encapsulated within the platform along with a, a user interface that's meant to be available to, uh, again, non-programmer, non-experts who can learn how to use this interface and run the software and, and, and run analyses, as well a bit more advanced programmatic API where, where you can actually run this through the command line if that's um, something that you uh, are familiar with and would like to do. And generally, it, it, it is then this environment that brings together all of these features to integrate data and tools and visualizations on these scalable um, computing resources. So that's a little bit of, about Galaxy. And as you're gonna see today in this, in this tutorial, and you may already be familiar with, the interface has, has a few different features to it. It has a, a column here that is the tools feature where you can now go and find the software that has been implemented within the Galaxy platform that you may be using. Um, this sort of center pane, which is really kind of the working working um, window that you will see as you start your analyses, as you put in settings for software, as you view results, as well as then this idea of the history. And this um, is, is something that's really important because when you run an analysis, it records and keeps track of all of the steps in that analysis, as well as recording um, and archiving all of the inputs and, and the results even intermediate or end results that come out of the analysis. Um, just another note about this is that what one feature that we always were, were very much attracted to about Galaxy and is a big part of the work we do is the community-based um, uh, focus of Galaxy and in that there's a Galaxy tool shed. So as tools become available in, in the Galaxy environment, they can be published to this public tool shed and then others who use Galaxy in maybe their local installs of Galaxy can find those tools and, and install them in their local um, instances. Another key that you will see here today is this idea of workflows and histories. So as I've already alluded to, when you get a, a bit more complex uh, bioinformatic analysis to do, many times it, it goes from a single software tool where you have a single input, it runs through a software tool and it gives you an output, to more of a workflow where you now have several software tools. The input uh, goes into one software tool and the output that comes from that software tool may be used as the input for a next downstream software tool. So sort of this pathway, if you will, of software that all work together. Um, and that's the concept of a, a workflow. So you can build in Galaxy once these tools are integrated that are interoperable and, and can work with each other. You can build these integrated workflows um, which link together these different tools. And a nice feature is that these can be saved with all of the various optimized settings for each tool. So now it becomes a much more automated process wherein data can be taken in and the workflow started. Each tool in succession runs and gives you a final output. And the other piece here is a history, which, which is a bit beyond a workflow. It's, it's using the tools that might be a part of a workflow, but then it's also saving all of the input and output data that was utilized uh, with, with that workflow. So it's really a recorded archive of an analysis that you have done, and Galaxy records all of these analyses and gives you a chance then to explore intermediate results as well, well as the, the end results that may come out of, of an analysis or an analysis workflow. Um, going along with this idea of workflows and histories, what is also a nice feature is that um, one can share, whether it's a history or a workflow, can share these, these saved analyses or these saved workflows that, that have all of the different tools with all of the settings that are already incorporated in. 
So it makes it very much usable and reproducible by others that you, that you want to share these analyses with. And this can be done through sharing of a URL, um, or you, there is a function where you can actually save these as a, as a file type that can then be uploaded in other Galaxy instances to be, to be used. Going along with this idea of this community focus of Galaxy, another real nice feature is that um, access to Galaxy has is, is also been a, a big focus of the community. So there are some publicly available resources like this usegalaxy.star network. Um, so there is a, a Galaxy instance publicly available that you can register and use at Galaxy uh, in Europe, Galaxy EU. There's usegalaxy.org, which is a United States-based uh, Galaxy instance. There's an Australian one, as well as some other public uh, instances that are available around the world. Um, this is just a snapshot of uh, the proteomics portal that is, is part of the, the, the European Galaxy public instance. So another aspect here is trying to not only um, train people how to use these tools for their own analyses, but give resources and access where, where these analyses can actually be run. Hi everyone, my name is Saskia Hilteman. I work at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. And today I'll be walking you through the first half of the metatranscriptomics tutorial. And then I will hand over to Sabina Meta for the second half. Um, in this tutorial, we will go over how you can analyze metatranscriptomic data and what kind of information you can extract from this. Uh, and we'll show you how you can assign a taxonomy and function to the identified sequences. Um, so there are multiple reasons to study the microbiome. One big reason is healthcare research. So uh, human bodies have a lot of microorganisms in them in various places, and these can affect your health uh, or how well drugs uh, work for you. And there's even so much um, genetic data from microorganisms that is sometimes referred to as your second genome. And another big area of study are environmental studies because microbes also um, are present in the soil and this can affect uh, how well plants um, grow, for example. Um, so it's studied in agriculture a lot. Uh, and I think you've probably seen this slide before, but uh, in metaomics, there are several different levels at which we can look at the microbiome. So we can do metagenomics. Um, this is often used for taxonomy and also a little bit for function if you do a whole genome shotgun sequencing. Um, but of course, this only shows you the potential um, that the microbiome has for, for these functions. If you also want to look at what is actually um, being um, expressed, you look at a metatranscriptomics uh, or metaproteomics or a combination of these. So today we'll focus on this level, the metatranscriptomics, and look at both taxonomy and function. Uh, this tutorial uses the ASIM pipeline. Um, so here you see a schematical overview of this. Um, it was published um, in 2018 by Bernice Batu from Freiburg uh, and colleagues, and more recently uh, a specialized ASIM MT, ASIM metatranscriptomics, was also published uh, with specialized workflows for metatranscriptomics data. So that's what we will cover. Um, now this pipeline, um, the first part, like with any analysis, will cover um, quality control. So it's always important to, to clean your data, to assess the quality before you begin. And then we have uh, two downstream parts. Um, one is to really look at the, the taxonomy, um, who is there, which microorganisms do we have, and then secondly, we're also going to look at the function, like what are these microorganisms doing? And uh, at the end of this, we will do some visualization uh, as well. And we will use data um, from, um, from a study, from a data set um, studying cellulose degradation in a biogas reactor. So they took samples um, of this community in this biogas reactor uh, over different time points. Um, to see how, how it changes over time. Um, so it's a lot of data in this tutorial. We will only look at one time point, uh, but we'll also show you some of their results uh, looking across multiple time zones. Now, before we go any further, I am going to um, start 
with the hands-on part, and then I'll come back to explain some of this. So let me just go, let's start by accessing Galaxy. So make sure you have your Galaxy instance open. Uh, I'm using Galaxy Europe, but this works on multiple different Galaxy servers. So make sure you are logged in and start a new history. So if your history is not empty, just click the plus icon here um, to uh, start a new history and then just name it um, something that you can remember, Metatran script tonics. Okay, so all the steps we will do today are uh, also in a GTN tutorial. So to access that, you can click this little hat icon um, to overlay the training materials uh, over your galaxy. So for you, it'll probably show you the home page. Um, so I'll just show you how to get to the tutorial from there. So this is the GTN homepage. We are going to go to metagenomics um, topic. And within that topic, we're going to scroll down. And at the bottom, you see here metatranscriptomic analysis. Uh, you'll notice that there are two versions of the, this tutorial. So we have here the uh, full tutorial and a shorter tutorial. For the sake of time today, we'll do the shorter tutorial. So if you click on the computer icon next to that, you will open the, um, the tutorial itself. So here you can find all the information uh, and more background information than maybe I, uh, I covered today in this video. So if you are curious and want to read more about it, I would recommend going through this tutorial. Um, and if you want to really go through it step by step, tool by tool, uh, I would do the, the long version of this tutorial because the two tutorials are exactly the same, except this short tutorial, we will use um, a set of workflows for each section, just so you have to do a little bit less clicking and we can focus more on the outputs and what is happening, but uh, otherwise the two are the same. And you can also switch between the long and the short version at the start of each um, section. Um, in case you are more interested in certain sections and want to get a little bit more detail, you can switch to the full one there. And if there are other parts that you maybe are a little bit less interested in right now, you can do them in the fast tutorial. But let's start with getting our data into, into our history. So there are two ways you can do that. So if you scroll down here um, to the data upload part, um, it'll instruct you how to do this. We need these two files. So we can copy these URLs that we see in the gray box. We can use this copy button. And then if we click outside this tutorial again, we'll go back to our Galaxy server. And then we're gonna go to the, on the left side to upload data, paste fetch data. And then we just paste our URLs in and hit start. Okay, so you see that my upload is finished. Uh, so I have the data in. Now all I need is the, um, the workflow we're going to run. So we're going to go back to the training materials. So the first section is all about quality control. Um, we do several steps and I will explain what each of these steps does uh, after we start the, the workflow. But we're going to assess quality using FastQC and MultiQC. Then we're going to filter these reads using CutAdapt. And we're going to remove ribosomal RNA using SortMeRNA. And then we're going to interlace these FASTQ files into a single file uh, because one of the next tools needs that. So to save you a little bit of clicking, we have made this part of the um, of the assigned workflow also available as a smaller workflow, uh, which we can import. So how to do that is described in this next hands-on box. Um, so let's start by copying this URL of this workflow. You can uh, right click and copy the link and then we will go back to our galaxy at the top here you see this menu workflows if you click on that you will see the list of all your workflows and at the top there is a create button and an import button so we are going to import an existing workflow from url so click on the import button and here it asks for url so we're just going to paste that in and say import. I 
Okay, and I see here at the top of my list, I see uh, workflow one pre-processing. Now, if you want to see what that workflow looks like, you can always click on the title here and click edit. And then you will go to the workflow editor and you can see a little bit what uh, goes on in that uh, workflow, but I will explain it uh, in more detail. But here you see every one of these boxes um, is a tool that will be run. And these two are the, the input data sets. Uh, so fast QC on both the input data sets that goes into multi QC. And then based on what we see here, we will run cut adapt to, to do some filtering and trimming on the data. Then take out the ribosomal RNA and then interlace. But um, we don't want to edit it. We really just want to run it. So we are going to go back to our workflow menu. And this time hit on this play button to the right of it. And then we can start our workflow. So it needs two inputs. So one's a forward FASTQ file and a reverse FASTQ file. So we only have two files in our history. Um, so make sure you select the, uh, the file with forward in the name for the forward file and the reverse file for the second input. And that's it. Then we just hit run workflow. And now you can see here a little bit the progress. So first it'll schedule your uh, your jobs and then you will see a progress bar as it starts uh, running and completing these jobs. But while we wait for that, I will go back to the slides and explain a little bit more about what happens in this part of, uh, of the tutorial and this workflow. Um, so the slides that I use are um, in the same place next to the, the workflow, uh, sorry, next to the tutorial. So you can click on this, uh, this logo if you want to see them yourself. So let's catch back up. Okay, so the input format that we have are FASTQ files. Um, probably you've seen uh, FASTQ files before. If you have not, I recommend you um, follow the quality control tutorial. Um, before jumping into this one. But just as a refresher, this is what a FASTQ format looks like. Every read um, is described by four lines. The first line is the name of the read. The second line is the sequence. Um, then you have this plus, or sometimes it's, uh, it's the name again. And then you have the quality score. So each of these um, symbols and letters encodes a quality score. So this means the C has a quality score of A. This T down here has a quality score of colon. Okay. It all sounds a little bit cryptic. So what does this mean? Uh, depends a little bit on the sequencer, exactly which of these characters maps to which quality score. What you see here uh, nowadays, almost all of them will be uh, FASTQ Sanger. Uh, so Illumina also uses this nowadays which means that, for example, um, the A that we saw before means a quality score of 32. And the colon is here, so that means a quality score of 25. Um, so that's a little bit uh, more intuitive to grasp. 40 is better than 25, for example. But still, what does this mean? So these are FRED scores. Um, and the FRED quality score of 10, which would be in this case, let's say uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, asterisk, that would mean that the sequencer um, has confidence of about 90% uh, that this is, that it made the correct call. So if there's a chance of one in 10 um, that this base scale is incorrect. And this is a logarithmic scale. So if you go up to a quality score of 20, that means, okay, and now I'm 99% sure about this call. And if you go up to 40, um, then the sequencer says, okay, I'm 99.99% sure um, that this base is really what I, what I said it was. Um, but of course, in your FASTQ file, you have thousands, hundreds, thousands, millions of reads. So you don't really want to look at this um, in this way. So that's why we use um, tools like FASTQC to sort of um, make this to a little bit more user-friendly so we can um, assess the quality. 
So the forward reads are in one file, the reverse reads are in another file. Both of those we will send to FastQC uh, for a quality report. Then we will merge those together into a multi-sample quality report. And then based on that, we will do some filtering and trimming. So you see here, I made a dotted arrow, which means usually um, you, in between here, you have a look at the quality report before you decide on the uh, settings to use for filtering and trimming. And often it's um, after that, you look at the results after filtering and trimming, you do another quality assessment, see if it has improved enough. And maybe you do this multiple times until you uh, end up with a clean, a data set of high quality that you're happy to continue with. So once we are happy, we will go uh, on and filter the ribosomal RNAs from this data set. Um, so uh, ribosomal RNA is very uh, handy for taxonomy, for identifying which species uh, we have, but not so much for functional um, annotation of the, the sequences. So before we do the functional part of the analysis, we want to remove these ribosomal RNAs. And then the last step we do in this workflow is we take these forward and reverse reads, the clean versions of them, and we turn them into a single interlaced file that contains both forward and reverse reads. Um, so this is the same again with the tools that we use in this case of FastQC for the quality reports multi-QC for the multi-sample quality reports, cut adapt for filtering and trimming, sort me RNA to remove the ribosomal RNA, and FASTQ interlace to combine the forward and reverse FASTQ files into a single FASTQ file. Okay, so once our workflow is finished, we will see a, uh, a live example of this, but uh, FASTQC, again, you probably saw this in the quality control um, tutorial, so I won't go into too much detail, um, but that tutorial really has a lot of information. So if you are curious about these reports, please follow that tutorial. And there's also more information in the metatranscriptomic tutorial about these specific reports. Uh, but this is basically what it looks like. So you get a little web page that has some summary metrics at the top and then a bunch of um, plots showing you something about the, uh, the quality. So this is much nicer to look at than the raw FASTQ files. So for example, this, um, this plot here shows you uh, the quality uh, per base. So on the left here, you see the, the first read in every base on average has a quality of 33. Um, and all the way over to the end of the read and you see that this is quite typical. Usually you see this, the beginning of the reads are more accurate and then towards the end, it gets harder and harder to, for the sequencer to make a correct call. So the, um, the quality drops, but you see here, it still remains over 30 throughout. Um, so that is still considered quite good uh, quality score. So we would be happy with this. But if you see this drop down into the red zone, you would probably decide to um, do some, some trimming of the ends here and say, take all my reads, remove the base or remove bases from the end if they are under a certain threshold, if they're under 20, for example. Um, so then you will have cleaner data, but you also have shorter reads. Um, so you want to find this balance between uh, cleaning up your data, but also not throwing away too much of your reads because you're also throwing away information. And especially if you're gonna do something like mapping, um, yeah, this might lead to less accurate um, mapping downstream. So just try and find that balance. Okay, so we discussed this plot, uh, but it's not the only one. So there are many more here. Um, there's a link here to the dedicated QC tutorial. Um, and I would also just take your time, look through all of these. And if you have any questions, look in the, uh, the tutorial or let us know. And I will show you some of these uh, after our workflow is done as well. Now, these are really nice outputs. So FASTQC is really nice, but it only works for one sample at a time, which is great if you only have one or two samples. But once you start doing um, analyses on hundreds of samples at once, uh, you don't want to really look at 100 individual reports like this. So there's a really cool tool, it's called MultiQC. So this can combine multi, um, multiple outputs from other tools. So it can take 
the FASTQC output from, uh, from different samples and combine them into a single report. So here's an example of one of these reports. It'll give you some summary information about different samples, their uh, GC content length, uh, duplication level, etc., and also show you like these uh, these plots that you again recognize from FASTQC. But now it shows you the plot with um, several samples shown in the same plot. So you can hover over these to see which uh, which line belongs to which sample. So it's really a nice interactive tool. Uh, and the great thing is it doesn't work only for summarizing FASTQC output. If you have uh, outputs from other popular tools, uh, MultiQC can also combine those. So it's a very versatile tool, very useful. Okay, um, so after we assess our quality, we maybe decide, okay, we need to, to clean this up a little bit. Um, maybe the ends are, aren't looking so good. So then we uh, use a trimming and filtering tool. In our case, we use cut it up, but there are a lot of tools out here that do basically the same thing. So um, you, can, you can try several of these uh, to find which ones work best for you. So one thing cut it up will do is it'll trim low quality bases from the reads. Um, so for example, at the end, if the quality drops too low, it'll just cut them off and make the reads uh, shorter. Um, but if because of this, the read becomes too short, we also probably want to throw it away because it won't be useful for us uh, for downstream analysis. So we'll also set some thresholds on, uh, on the length of these things. Um, and it also looks at, for example, mean quality score. So if the average over this entire um, read is too low, we'll just throw the whole read out. And something else it can do, which is very useful, is it can remove any adapters or primers that may be uh, left in your data. So often when you get your data back, these will already have been removed and you don't have to worry about it. But tools like CutAdapt can also detect these, um, especially if they're from popular platforms, and just remove them for you. So like I said, CutAdapt is not the only tool that does this. You also have uh, Trim Galore, Trimomatic, uh, many more. Um, and lots of these are in Galaxy as well. So uh, please go and explore. And then, like I said, after that, so we've done our, assessed our quality, we've cleaned up the data based on those quality reports. Um, and then we are ready to do um, assign a taxonomy. Um, but the other thing we want to do is also assign function. And for this, we want to remove the ribosomal RNA sequences first because they're not very informative. So there is this tool called sort me RNA that will take all our reads It'll um, align them against a database of uh, ribosomal RNA sequences. Um, and then everything that is, uh, is a good match with known uh, ribosomal RNA sequence um, will be taken out. And then for the functional uh, part of this analysis, we will only um, look at the data set without the RNA sequences. And then the final step of this workflow is FASTQ interlacer. So this is a little bit more of a technical um, thing uh, that we need to do. But uh, most of the time, if you have paired end data, um, you will have two files, uh, one file containing the forward reads and one the reverse reads. So when we do paired end sequencing, typically the DNA is cut into, um, or the sequence is cut into longer fragments like this. And then part uh, of the one side of the fragment is uh, a sequence, say, um, say 250 um, base pairs, and also part of the, the end. Um, and these belong together. So we have not only the sequence for these smaller parts, but we also know something about how far apart these two should be. So this gives us extra information for the mapping step. So for example, if this forward read could possibly map to multiple places in the genome. Um, then we can use the information about the reverse read to narrow down which is the real real place it came from. So we can say, okay, not only does this have to match, but we know that say 500 bases downstream, this reverse read also has to map. And then you can do a little bit more accurate mapping. And so like I said, most of the time you will receive this in two separate files. 
but sometimes you get this in one uh, interlaced file and some tools also expect two separate files and other tools expect one interlaced file uh, and one of the ones that we are going to use today really wants this interlaced format um, so we're going to convert it using fastq interlacer um, so how that would look as it would take these forward and reverse reads and basically just alternate them and put them in one big file so um, the first um, read in this file will be forward read of the first pair then comes the reverse read of the first pair then the forward read of the second pair and the reverse feed read of the second pair and so on uh, and there's also tools to do this the other way around by the way so if you have an interlaced file like this but you have a tool that needs two separate forward and reverse reads files um, there's also deinterlacing tools to go back here so this is really just a format conversion that we need to do um, for some of the downstream tools okay before we move on to this next part i'm just going to check on my galaxy analysis so let me see how far my galaxy is so we see it's still running um, but it should be done soon um, so just wait until yours is done before continuing so but we see that some steps are already done so we can already start by looking at for example the fastqc output so you see fastqc we have four items here two uh, that run on the forward reads and two in the reverse and the interesting one here for us is the web page output so if we click here uh, on the eye icon for one of the web pages so this is the the forward read um, then we can see this uh, this fastqc report let me just drag these ends over to get a bit more room so here you can see at the top um, yeah, some more information. So we see we have 260,000 total sequences. Um, each sequence is about 150 base pairs long. And you see the quality is already quite good, um, at least for this, this data set, the forward reads. And also this, the per sequence quality scores are also very good, very high. So anything between 30 and 40 is, is very good. Um, and then there are a couple more um, plots here and I would take your time and look at these and also look at the, the QC tutorial about what all these plots mean. Um, for example, this gives you the per base sequence content. Um, so this gives, shows you um, how many, uh, what the percentage of A, C, T's and G's are. And this pattern for RNA-seq is pretty typical. So you have here sort of these, these spikes at the beginning, and that is due to um, the random hexamers um, that are used in, in that protocol. Um, yeah, so look at this a bit um, and feel free to ask any questions if you have them. Um, so the nice thing we can now show also uh, multi-QC. So let's go to multi-QC and the web page output again. And now you can see not only um, the one file, but you can now also see both forward and reverse in the same uh, in the same plot. And you see it's all the same plots as we saw just now. Um, and if you click on here, you see this plot again. And it has some extra features. So now you can, for example, see, see a heat map here. And some other things. So this is really nice, especially when you get to have uh, more, more samples than this. Okay, so I'm just gonna wait really quickly until this is done, and then we can continue. Okay, so now my workflow is finished, so we can check out the other outputs. Um, so we already looked at uh, multi-QC and fast-QC. Um, another thing we did was uh, cut adapt. Uh, so cut adapt gives you a um, fastq file with the clean reads, but it also gives you a report that you can look at. Um, so if you click on the eye icon for the report output, um, it'll give you a little bit more information. 
Um, so in the summary, it'll tell you how many pairs were progress, uh, processed, how many adapters were still present. So we see that in our data set, the adapters were already trimmed off. Um, and it'll show you how many reads were uh, filtered out and for what reason. Um, so you can see here, for example, um, how many base pairs were um, were processed and how many were removed because the quality was too low. Um, and the top here you can see uh, after this removal of base pairs, if any of the reads were too short, um, they were removed. And we see that uh, for this reason, 10% of our reads were removed. Uh, and now we are left with, we started with 260,000 um, uh, sequences and after this quality control step we are left with 232,000 um, reads so about 90 percent. So that's all looks good but it's always a good idea to check this to make sure that this step wasn't too strict and you didn't for example throw away 90 percent of your data and are only left with with a little bit that might not be enough information for your downstream reports. So always make sure to, to check these reports and just make sure that they make sense for your data. Okay, now, so we did quality control, quality assessment, we uh, filtered and trimmed. Um, and another thing we mentioned already was sort me RNA for the functional assignment. We want to get rid of ribosomal RNA sequences. So sort me RNA. Um, so you see that it gives two outputs, which are uh, FASTQ files. So these are the FASTQ files that are not ribosomal, um, or sorry, that are ribosomal, the aligned ones. And then the unaligned ones are the ones that are not ribosomal. So they didn't align to this database of ribosomal RNA. Um, and it also gives this log file output. And if you look at that one, um, a little bit, the first bit is uh, not so interesting, a little bit cryptic, but uh, if you scroll down to the bottom, you see here under this results header, some uh, more information so we can see here it processed uh, 460,000 uh, uh, reads in total so um, that is 232,000 pairs uh, and then it also shows you how many were past the E value threshold so that means how many were uh, um, deemed to be ribosomal RNA so we see that 25 percent of the reads approximately were um, thought to be ribosomal RNA and the rest are not. So this 75% of non-ribosomal RNA sequences are what we are going to use for the functional part of this, this workflow. Um, okay, and then the very last file uh, tool we ran was the interlacer. And you see here that we um, Yeah, we end up with um, a single FASTQ file now that contains uh, both forward reverse reads. And you can always recognize that if you look inside the file, um, you have here this um, read name, and then it has slash one here, meaning the forward half of the pair, and then you see the next. So these four lines are the first forward part of the first pair. And then the next four reads are the second read, which is has the same um, identifier there, and then this slash two behind it to indicate that it's the reverse file. So it's the exact same information as the two separate files, uh, but just put into one file because some tools want that. Okay, so now we have a nice clean data. Um, now we can get on with the actual exciting part of, um, yeah finding the taxonomy of our sample and um, the function. So I'm gonna go back to my tutorial and I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm going to um, start the workflow and then I'm gonna explain what the workflow does. And like I said, there is uh, more information in the tutorial itself, um, especially in the extended tutorial if you want more, more background information about this and about each of the individual tools. So in the next part, we are going to do the uh, taxonomic profiling. So we're gonna ask ourselves which uh, organisms are there? Uh, what do we have? What is the community structure? Um, and then after that, uh, Sabina will take you through all the, the functional um, information analysis. Um, so we will use for this 
uh, taxonomic assignment, we will use uh, Metaflan. Um, so this will take all our data set and compare it to a database of, of marker, uh, marker genes um, from over uh, 17,000 um, reference sequences, bacterial, archaea, viral, eukaryotic, um, et cetera. And then after that, we will um, we'll visualize this using um, Krona and Graphland tools. OK, but again, to sort of save you a little bit of clicking, we uh, combine these steps into a single um, single workflow. So let's do the same thing again here. We um, copy this link to this workflow and go back to our Galaxy. Uh, go to workflow menu at the top. We click import. We paste in the URL we just copied from the training manual and hit import workflow button. And again, we want to run it. So we're going to scroll to the right and click I run workflow on this workflow to community profile. It should be uh, pretty clear about what it wants here. So it has, uh, again, two inputs. So it just wants the clean data set. So the QC controlled forward reads. So those would be, um, okay, they're named already uh, properly in, in your history. So we take here QC controlled forward reads and QC controlled reverse reads. Uh, and then we hit run workflow. Okay, so while this is running, I will go back again to the slides and explain to you what each step does. Um, okay, let's go. So what we, our objective here is to find the community profile. So we want to identify which organisms are present in our sample and what the relative abundances are. So here is a a little um, depiction. So we'd want to know like, okay, how many different species are there? And also do we have, how many of these red guys do we have, for example, compared to these, these green guys? Um, so for this, we use a Metaflan 2 for identification. And then to make this sort of a little bit nicer to explore and to evaluate, we'll use uh, visualization again. Uh, so Metaflan 2, what this does, it, um, it estimates the presence and relative abundance of microbial cells uh, by mapping against a set of marker sequences in a database. And now keep in mind that this tool was originally designed for DNA-seq data. Um, so we can still use it in metatranscriptomics. We just have to be a little bit more careful about the interpretation. So, because for DNA-seq, we can, um, with these relative abundances, we can say something about, okay, this organism is is more present in the sample than, than this other um, organism, for example. Uh, but with transcriptomics data, we have to be careful, of course, because this can be skewed by expression um, of these different um, organisms, but it still gives us valuable information. Um, then after this, so the outputs from Metaflan, um, again, aren't very nice to look at, uh, not very uh, friendly to human eyes. So we use um, visualization tools to, to make this a little bit nicer to explore for us. So one very nice tool is called Krona. So this uh, visualizes a uh, community composition in an interactive plot. So you can see here already, if I hover over it changes and I can uh, double click somewhere to say, okay, show me only the bacteria. And you see that in this case, we have pretty sort of simple sample. We have two species here. And you see that um, that, that this one is present in 95% in of the sample or accounts for 95% um, of the sequences in our sample and the other 5% um, from this other organism. And... Um, Second nice visualization tool we can use is Graphlan. So this shows us also the composition, but a little bit more about the, the relationship between um, the, the different um, species we found, uh, cladogram view. 
and um, all this can lead us to, to sort of making uh, or seeing how the composition of our sample changes over time. So we in this tutorial only do it for one time point from this data set. Um, so that would be one of these bar graphs and say that, okay, uh, most of what we find are these two, uh, two species, um, Clostridium and uh, Coprothermobacter. Um, but you see that if you look over multiple time points that sort of the, um, the composition changes a little bit. So in this case, we're talking metatranscriptomics. So this is also the expression changes a little bit. Um, so yeah, and then you can sort of follow this community profile over time. That's exactly what they did in this study as well. So I'm gonna go now back to my galaxy and show you these outputs live. And then I'm gonna hand over to the next part for um, to Sabina for the functional analysis. Okay. So um, my jobs are still running. So again, I'm gonna wait till those are done and then discuss with you. Okay, so my workflow finished now. So we can have a quick look at these outputs. Um, so you can see here that Metaflan made quite a few outputs. Um, so you can look through these a little bit. Um, but for example, look at the um, predicted tax on relative abundances. If you look at that file you see here, it's again a little bit cryptic file. This shows you everything that it has detected um, in terms of taxonomy. So it gives you the, the full taxonomy. It says uh, the kingdom. So you see here that mostly we find bacteria and archaea. And then it just goes down. Um, down the list all the way to, to um, genera and species. Um, so here you can see, but again, this is not a very nice thing to look at, but you can see here at the bottom, the, the, the main species. Um, it also gives you the, um, the BAM file output. So um, how these aligned. Um, and a biome file. So biome is, is a standard file that you can also use for, for other input to other tools, visualization, for example. Um, but the visualization that we are gonna focus on today is Krona. So um, one of the Metaflan outputs um, is already specifically formatted for Krona. Um, and then if you scroll up a little bit more, you see that we ran Krona and the output, there's an HTML output um, so if you look at this, it's, it's the same as what was in the slides. Um, so again, we have a fairly uh, simple community in this case. We see we have a um, small number of uh, archaea here um, and the rest are bacteria. And, and if you focus in on those bacteria, we see that it's 95% coming from, uh, from this organism and 5% from this one. And then you can always go back up to the root by clicking there and it'll show you again everything that it found. And let's just look at the second visualization. So Graflan also makes a couple different outputs. So it makes, uh, makes a tree um, and tree in a different format. Again, you can use this to connect to other tools. But for now, we're just gonna look at the image output, the PNG. And you see here that it's not quite as, um, exciting as the one I showed in the slides, again, because we have a fairly simple community here. Uh, but you see here that it shows you um, this, this uh, one species from Archaea and these two bacteriums, uh, and also um, the, the relationship between the two. So you see that these are uh, very unrelated. And the size of these uh, bubbles sort of also shows uh, the relative abundance. So you see here 95% versus uh, 5%. So again, if you have a more complex community structure, uh, this becomes a little bit bigger. But these are very two very nice uh, visualization tools for showing the community composition of your um, of your sample. Um, okay, so with that, uh, I think we're now ready to focus on uh, the other really fun part: a functional uh, analysis of these. Um, of this community. So not only who is there, but also what are they doing? Um, and for that, I will hand over to Subina, who will, uh, will now continue 
um, with functional analysis part. So thanks and uh, have fun. Hello all, this is Sabina Mehta. I will be covering the last part of the assigned workflow, which is extracting the functional information from the metatranscriptomics data. Now that we know who is present in your sample using the previous workflow, we would now like to understand the question regarding what are these microorganisms doing? Or what are the functions performed by the microorganisms in the environment. The three main outputs from the workflow are in obtaining information regarding gene pathways, gene ontology, which is further classified into biological process, molecular function, and cellular component, and lastly, but not the least, the gene family. Before getting into details of the workflow, Let's do a hands-on training on how to run the workflow. For that, in the Use Galaxy instance, go to the Share Data on the top, click on Workflows, search for Galaxy P, and or any of these tags, Metatranscriptomics or Metagenomics, then click on the Metatranscriptomics WF3 Functional Information. Click on that workflow and then import it using the plus sign. I will be showing two methods to import the workflow next. So, after running your second workflow, your Galaxy interface should look something like this, with the second workflow completed here. The last output should be the Graphland PNG output. Right now, I will show you two methods for importing the workflow to run your functional information workflow. So for that, we use two methods, getting it from the shared data or getting it from the Galaxy training network. The first method I will show you is from the shared data. So for that, go ahead, click on shared data, select workflows, and we will look for Metatranscriptomics Workflow 3 Functional Information Workflow. The owner is Galaxy P. Currently, this is on top of my list, but it doesn't have to be so. So if you want to look for this data, please search here. You can search for Metatranscriptomics, Galaxy P, or Metagenomic Tag. Now, when you search for that, there will be two workflows that will come up on your screen. If you look carefully, both the workflows are similar, but there's a small difference. The quick part of the workflow, we generally use for our hands-on online training where we have time constraint. In the short version of the workflow, we do not have the human tool because it is very time consuming. But for this workshop, we are using the longer version. So please select the Metatranscriptomics WF3 functional information. Please make sure you're not using the quick version. Please select that. And you can see the tools that are present in the workflow by scrolling down. To import this workflow, please click on the plus sign on, on the right side. Once you click on it, it will import the workflow into your own account. You can click on start using this workflow. Once I click on that, you will see that is the workflow it comes into my account. The other way to import this workflow is by clicking on the Galaxy Training Materials. Go to Metagenomics.
select the metatranscript metatranscriptomics short version even though this says short you will still have the longer version of the tutorial present you can scroll down or you can directly click on extract functional information and you can see there is information regarding how to import the workflow so as it is written over here copy the url via right click or you can download it to your computer and upload it later but i will right click it copy link address and then click on outside of this screen select import and paste it on the archived workflow URL information and then select import workflow. Now the workflow has already been imported. Now I can choose either of them. I'll just choose the first one just to show you how to run the workflow. To run the workflow, you can either click on edit if you want to see the tools involved in the workflow, which you can drag and then run the workflow by clicking on the play button on the right side of the screen. Or you can just go to workflow. And then there is play button on the right here. So if you click on that, the tools present in the workflow will be queued up in your center pane. Now, please make sure you're selecting the appropriate inputs you need for running the workflow. It is asking for the interlaced non-RRNA reads. So we will go ahead, click on it and select the interlaced non-RRNA reads. The next it is asking for the predicted taxon relative abundance out input. So for that, please click and scroll down. Now here you'll see two predicted taxon and relative abundance outputs, but please select the predicted taxon relative abundance only, not the one for Krona. So once you select that, go to the cut predicted tax on relative abundance table. So we'll select that and select the appropriate out input. Once you have made sure that you have selected the appropriate input, you can scroll down to see all the tools. Once you're confident that your inputs that you have provided is correct, please go ahead and run the workflow. When you start running the workflow, it could take a few minutes or a few seconds at least to start invoking the workflow. Once the invocation step is complete, all the tools that you have just ran would show up on the right side, which is in the history pane. The tools will be gray at first, as you can see, when it's running, it will be orange in color. And once completed, it will. Now that you have imported and successfully run the workflow, let's move on understanding what you just ran. In the metatranscriptomics data, we have access to the genes that are expressed by the community. We can use that to identify genes their functions and build pathways, etc., to investigate their contribution to the community using the HUMAN tool. HUMAN stands for Human Microbiome Project Unified Metabolic Analysis Network. It is developed by the Huttenhauer Lab. It is a pipeline in itself that is wrapped as a single tool in the Galaxy platform. The two main inputs for this workflow are the interlaced non-RRNA reads and the predictive taxon or community profile from MetaFlan tool. 
To identify the functions made by the community, we do not need the rRNA sequence, especially because they add noise and will slow down. The next few tools in the workflow are used for downstream processing of the human data. I will be going into details regarding each and every tool later on. Human, as I mentioned earlier, it is a pipeline developed for efficiently and accurately profiling the presence or absence and abundance of microbial pathways in a community from metagenomic or metatranscriptomic sequencing data. It efficiently characterizes microbial metabolic pathways. The, this is the galaxy wrapper of the human tool. The two main inputs are the interlaced non-RNA reads and the taxonomic profile from the Metaflan tool. The user has an option to add additional ID mapping file for alignments, but in this workflow, we have not added that feature. The tool itself consists of inbuilt databases such as Chocoflan database, UNIREF50 and 90 database, and MetaSeq and Unipathway database for pathway analysis. The three main outputs of the human tool are gene family and their abundance, gene pathways and their coverage, and the pathway and their abundance. Let's go into detail on how the human tool functions. Human performs a tiot metaomic search. The main input of the tool is a quality controlled metagenome or in this case, metatranscriptome. The next step is the initial taxonomic screening by using the metaflan inputs that you have just provided. It maps the reads to clade-specific marker genes to rapidly identify community species. Then, it maps the reads to pangenomes of identified species and performs a nucleotide-level mapping against the Chocoflan database. The reads are now classified or unclassified reads. The unclassified reads are aligned to a comprehensive and non-redundant database, which is UNIREF90 or UNIREF50 through an accelerated translated search. The results are further searched with the UniPathway or MetaSeq database to give you the pathway information. The mapping results give you gene family and pathway abundance by looking at the gene length, alignment quality, and gene coverage. Here is an output of the gene family abundance and gene pathway abundance. This file details the abundance of each gene family and pathway in the community. Gene families are a group of evolutionary related protein coding sequences that are often perform similar functions. Here we are using UNIREF90 gene family sequences in the gene families that have at least 90% sequence identity. Both the gene family abundance as well as pathway abundance is reported in RPK values, which means reads per kilobase. These are units to normalize for gene length. It reflects the relative gene or transcript copy number in the community. You can see there are things called unmapped or unintegrated in these two output. These are really the reads which remain unmapped even after both the alignment steps, which is the nucleotide as well as the translated search. Now that we have the gene family output, we can see how complicated it is to understand. Thus, we can use the regrouping tool, which is called the human 2 regrouping tool, to group the gene families or convert the UNIREF50 and 90 outputs 
to different categories by providing it with the ID mapping file. Now it could be converted into MetaSeq reactions, CAG ortho groups, PFAM domains, enzyme commission categories, gene ontology, informative Go, and SlimGo. In this workflow, we use the gene ontology terms. The gene ontology or Go term analysis is widely used to reduce complexity and highlight biological process in a genome-wide expression study. This dedicated tool groups and converts the unit of 50 or 90 gene family abundance generated by human into Go terms. Now, as the regrouping tool converts the unit of 50 or 90 values into Go terms, we still think that the output is too precise. Thus, we use the rename tool to further classify the Go terms into molecular function, biological process, and cellular component categories. There is another tool which can split the human tool output into a stratified or unstratified table which basically means that the stratified table will provide information regarding the Go term, the function, genus, and species involved, along with the abundance value. Whereas the unstratified table will give you information regarding only the Go terms and their abundance in the sample. Here, is an example of how the unit of value is converted to Go terms using the rename tool. As you can see here, these are the Go terms, the genus, and the species, along with the abundance in RPK values in your gene family output, which is the human output. When you convert into Go terms, the outputs look something like this. That means it will have the Go ID, the function, which is molecular function in this case, and then its information, genus, and the species identified, plus the abundance value. Now, what we saw was basically only molecular function. There are three different outputs, as I mentioned before, molecular function, biological process, and cellular component. So in every case, you will see the Go ID with the function, the information regarding the function, genus, and species along with its abundance value. In this workflow, we have also incorporated tools such as Combined Metaflan and Human Output. But before using the combined tool, the first step is to normalize the abundance. For that, we use the renormalize tool. Gene family and pathway abundance are in the RPK, which is reads per kilo base values, accounting for gene length, but not for sample sequencing depth. While there are some applications, example strain profiling, where RPK units are superior to depth normalized units, most of the time we do need to renormalize our samples prior to downstream analysis. So for that, we use the renormalize tool. When we renormalize the outputs, the outputs look something like this. Once normalized, we use the combined Metaflan and Human outputs tool to combine the gene families or pathways together from the metaplan and the human to output. As the name suggests, it provides you the same information. It will give you information regarding the genus, the species, their abundance value, as well as the family ID. Now, if you would like to know which gene families are involved in our most abundant pathways along with the species, we use the Unpack Pathway Abundance to Show Genes tool. This tool comes from the Human Tool Suite. 
This tool also takes in the normalized pathway and gene family's output. As the name suggests, it renormalizes the gene and pathway abundance in copies per million or relative abundance values. It adds another level of stratification to the pathway abundance by including gene families. This is how the Galaxy wrapper for the unpacked pathway abundance looks like. And this is the output it provides you with. It gives you information regarding the most abundant pathway and the information regarding the pathway along with the gene, genus, and species involved. It also provides you with the UNREF IDs and their abundance value. That concludes the tools present in the last workflow. All the outputs from this workflow are tabular outputs, which you as a user can further process according to your liking. In conclusion, after running the assigned workflow, you can obtain all of the tabular outputs that is mentioned here. With respect to taxonomy, you get the information regarding kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, and strain. The user can specify what level of the taxa they want the output to have. And in the function category, you get the input regarding the pathway, gene ontology, which is further classified into biological process, molecular function, and cellular component, and gene family. As mentioned before, you can classify them into other outputs using other ID mapping files. Please take a look at the outputs that you just obtained after running the workflow once all of the items in your history turn green in color. Here is the paper we just published in the F1000 Research Journal on the work that we just presented. This concludes the hands-on portion of the training. Thank you for listening thus far. Now that we have learned about the pre-processing, taxonomic composition, as well as functional analysis using the assign empty workflow, it is important to note that the outputs that are generated by the assign workflow, especially the abundance values at the genus, species, or strain level, or pathways, gene ontology, and gene family abundances at the functional level, it is important to note that these values are generated for a single time point or a single replicate. If one is interested to compare multiple replicates or compare various conditions, it is important to take these outputs from various time points or various replicates and aggregate that into an output or an input that can be used for a tool called as MetaQuanto. So for example, here, your metatranscriptomics data and the abundance values associated with the function and taxonomy can be put into a tool called as MT2MQ, which is short for metatranscriptomics to metaquantome, which generates a tabular output that can go into a tool called as metaquantome. Now, metaquantome tool was originally developed for metaproteomics analysis, but is a set of R tools that can also be used for metatranscriptomics analysis quantitation which helps you to perform statistical analysis and generate visual outputs, uh, both for data uh, exploration, differential expression, or heat map cluster analysis. Uh, in order to understand a little bit more on MetaQuantum, let's try to understand how MetaQuantum functions. So MetaQuantum, as I mentioned earlier, was developed for metaproteomics analysis, wherein mass spectrometry based identification of peptides and the intensity levels as well as function and taxonomic information is used to feed it into MetaQuantum tool which performs statistical analysis to give you an idea about the functional and taxonomic state of a microbiome. This tool was developed by Caleb Easterly and has been published in 2019 in the Molecular Cell Proteomics.
In order to demonstrate the use of MetaQuantum, especially for meta transcriptomics data, we will use the same data set that uh, Saskia uh, described earlier in the study, in this, in this workshop. So this was a data set from Magnus Anson's lab, wherein food waste manure was used uh, to generate a microbiome that was serially diluted and eventually was uh, used for degradation of cellulose. Uh, and this particular cellulose degradation with a minimal microbiome was monitored at various time points, starting from zero time points to 43 hours. For this study, we used uh, time points 23, 33, and 38 hours, also called as T4, T6, and T7. And this data was analyzed by Praveen Kumar, Subina Mehta, and Marie Crane using the metatranscriptomics, MT2MQ, as well as MetaQuantum software. So just to give you a summary of the analysis, uh, there were uh, quite a few gene families, pathways that were detected, as well as gene ontology terms at the molecular functional level that were detected. And this was a simplistic microbiome in the sense there were only four prominent genera that were detected across the three time points. When we looked at taxonomy or genus abundance, one could find that coprothermobacter, hungitai clostridium, and methanobacter uh, methanothermobacter were the three main organisms that were present in this data set. And as you can see, uh, initially in, at time T4, uh, hungitai clostridium was the, was the dominant uh, organism or the genera, genus that was present, and it kind of decreased as, uh, as time progressed, while coprothermobacter uh, amendments increased as time progressed. We also performed principal components analysis based on the metatranscriptomics data. And with that, one can see that using either function or taxonomy, you can uh, see that time points T4, uh, A, B, C seem to cluster together as compared to the rest of the time points. With the metaproteomics data, which we also have available when we performed a metaquantum analysis, we actually saw a better separation of the early time points as compared to the rest of the time points. We also use this for heat map analysis, and this helped us to uh, differentiate these three time points uh, based, on this, um, based, on, based on the heat map analysis. One of the uh, interesting features of MetaQuantum is that it can perform this Volcano plot analysis, which helps you to detect any genes that are differentially expressed. And in this case, uh, at least here, what we have shown are uh, genes that are involved in cellulose degradation. Um, and these genes are, have shown to be overexpressed when you're comparing T6 over T4 or T7 over T4. One of the other interesting features of MetaQuantum is that it can also answer questions like, what are the functions expressed by a particular taxon? For example, if one is looking at hunger type Clostridium, uh, and when we looked at some of the genes expressed for cellulose degradation, you can see that these genes are getting down-regulated um, for hunger type clostridium. While you can also ask other question in terms of if I were to choose a particular function such as glycoside hydrolase or glycosyl transferase, what is the contribution of various genera to this particular, uh, to this particular function? And as you can see here, um, various organisms or different genera uh, contribute differently for this particular function. Now, in order to understand a little bit more about these new updates for MetaQuantum, as well as its use for time course analysis or for metatranscriptomics analysis, uh, I will strongly recommend you to uh, this manuscript that we published this year uh, in the Journal of uh, Proteome Research, uh, which highlights um, not only these two features, but also offers a step-by-step -step guide on how to use MetaQuantum. Lastly, I think it's very important uh, to understand the context on why we are performing metatranscriptomics analysis. So for data sets, we have metagenomic analysis. Uh, we could have metaproteomics analysis as well as metatranscriptomics analysis. And all of these three uh, methods have their strengths in what, what questions can be answered. And sometimes you can actually get a better answer if you take a systems biology or a holistic approach where you can integrate these three methods. 
and for this uh, i'll strongly recommend you to go to this uh, to this blog post uh, by um, bangladesh ansen wherein they have implemented their meta transcriptomics and meta proteomics tools uh, as well as uh, meta genomics tools within the galaxy framework to answer some really interesting uh, questions uh, when they set out to uh, take up take up this study um, you know since they had set up the experimental design for the study they had a very clear understanding on what are the questions um, that were that they were addressing so i'll strongly recommend that you can you should go and read about this uh, because this might give you some alternative tools that you could use for your metaomic analysis lastly if you are interested in finding out about functional microbiome galaxy workflows not in meta not only in meta transcriptomics but also for meta proteomics uh, i'll strongly recommend you to go to the galaxy europe uh, uh, the public instance as well as some of the tools and workflows are also available uh, in the Galaxy Training Network as part of the Meta Proteomics as well as Meta Transcriptomics tutorials, uh, as well as Meta Quantum tutorials. Uh, if you have any project specific or tool specific or workflow specific questions, please reach out to us at this uh, at this contact email address um, through this website, and we'll be ha uh, happy to answer any questions. Lastly, I'd like to uh, mention that this was a work not only done by researchers at the University of Minnesota and at the Minnesota Supercomputing Institute, but we have also uh, collaborated with researchers across the world, uh, users, experts in the field of metatranscriptomics microbiome research, as well as software developers uh, and uh, training experts who have uh, helped us to make this tutorial as well as uh, dissemination of these resources possible. Thank you very much for attending this workshop.